Good evening. Welcome to the Thursday, October 8th uh, Board of Education Finance and Operations Committee meeting. Uh, sorry we're a few minutes late. We had a some technical difficulty, but I think we're up and running now. Uh, in accordance with Section 7E of the Illinois Open Meeting Act, it has been determined that in-person attendance by the public at the meeting is not practical, prudent, or feasible due to COVID-19 considerations, including difficulty in maintaining appropriate social distancing in the meeting room and nearby spaces. Uh, public viewing and participation will be by electronic means, and if you're listening to that, you've figured out uh, what those electronic means are, so I won't read the website. Um, the committee's composed of three board members who are physically present at the meeting, um, and those are myself, Jim Collins, Karen Stufen, and Chris Kaczynski. We're also joined by two other board members, Kara Caforio and Margaret Harrell. Um, those board members may be present at the committee meeting and participate in discussions, but uh, the committee members each reach consensus, uh, um, consensus on and make recommendations to the board. So in other words, only the uh, finance and operations committee members uh, reach the consensus and make recommendation to the board or the, and or the superintendent. So uh, with tonight's meeting, um, Uh, next on the agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance. So if everyone will stand, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, and um, Kara, you were checking on public comments. Are there any? There are no public comments, okay? Then um, next on the agenda is the approval of our last meeting, September 9th, 2020, Finance and Operations Committee meetings. Those uh, minutes are uh, posted and in your packet. Any changes? Karen has one. I just want to make sure that um, on item B, uh, bond market update and tax abatement. The second sentence um, after the discussion, the district will move forward with the sale of the $40 million in bonds. That's not what we decided. That's that's not the right documentation of the conversation. Um, we, as a finance committee, recommend that we have that discussion at the board table and the board um, as a whole makes that decision. But we had discussed the parameters and um, uh, Gal Jim, what the last six years I think that we've had this plan going forward, so we just reviewed it, and we said based on uh, the numbers, it looks like that might you know that might be the right path to do, and what we needed is just to do the resolution to make it current, so that if the numbers were right, where we would save the taxpayers from paying additional or th they would pay less taxes um, based on refinancing the bonds. Um, if those, you know, the numbers and the markets were right, that you know we were recommending to the board that we pr continue to proceed in that fashion. Right. Um, yeah. So let's. So we should we change the wording of that saying uh, after discussion, um, the committee uh, recommended that we bring the uh, parameters resolution to the board at the next uh, board meeting. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any other changes? Hearing none, we'll let the rest of the minute stand with that one change to item B. Um, in fact, um, oh, well, all right, under H. Karen, remind me when we get to item H on tonight's agenda to give you an update about uh, the bond issue. Okay. Um, all right, so. Uh, next is the uh, a preview of the new Lincoln Elementary School interior uh, environment, character, and organization. So go ahead, please. Great. Thank you, Mr. Collins. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the board, Dr. Moyer, thanks for having us here today. Uh, I'm Craig Siepka. With me today is uh, Leanne Meyer-Smith, our project manager. You've, I, I think most of you have met her. 
So um, what we have is a um, hopefully a pretty quick presentation, um, or at least a presentation, certainly uh, part two of um, the, uh, the development of the design for Lincoln, the new Lincoln Elementary School. So what we thought we'd do today is, uh, uh, before we get into the meat of the presentation, which is really about the insides um, and all the good stuff that's going on in there, uh, share with you uh, just a couple of images, uh, things that we've talked about before, just as a little refresher for, for those of you that have, have seen it uh, or at the last board meeting, and certainly uh, those of you that haven't, it'd be a, a great way of catching up. And um, this first image that you're looking at over here is uh, really a slide that we've been using to help depict and uh, uh, demonstrate uh, the sort of the kind of materials that we're talking about or looking at using on the outside, the exterior of the building. Combination of uh, different types of masonries and woods that you see over on the right. And on the left, uh, actually even more significant, at least for the interiors, um, some of the color palettes that, uh, and, and colors that we've seen on the houses that surround the, uh, surround the site particularly important because this is a neighborhood school. So being able to be compatible with uh, the materials as well as uh, the colors really uh, kind of helps us um, make some decisions and recommendations for what the building itself could be uh, on the outside, as you have previously seen, but uh, more, more significantly, at least for this presentation and then for the kids and the teachers that are going to be living in the school on a daily basis, what goes on on the inside. And uh, Leanne will be able to share a lot of those details with you in, in, just, uh, in just a few minutes. This first image over here is what you're looking at uh, that we're proposing for the, uh, the west side of the site, uh, the New Lincoln uh, middle, uh, Elementary School. This is the, the main entrance right by the front drop-off drive. Um, and uh, you know, see, really kind of see a combination of these alternating um, wood composite panels and, and glass as it wraps around the building uh, from right uh, going to the left side. And then the back over there, uh, just uh, a view of the, uh, the tornado shelter slash gymnasium that is there for, uh, for uh, a myriad of different events. Um, but again, uh, underneath the sign, that's your main entrance over there, ample waiting, uh, lots of visibility to people that are uh, for the administration, uh, to people that are entering and coming to the site and to, uh, uh, from the parking lot or from, uh, from the adjoining neighborhood. So um, kind of a nice combination of, uh, of uh, different materials, both solid and uh, opaque as well as transparent, both from an aesthetic standpoint, but uh, from our standpoint, uh, a safety and security standpoint as well creates a lot of different opportunities and, uh, and uh, for uh, all that good stuff to happen. Now the second image that we'd like to share with you uh, really uh, takes us then into a, a deeper conversation about the interiors. And really, this is at the current corner of Hillside and Montrose, um, looking at the three classroom neighborhoods that, uh, that really populate the, uh, that line up along the east side of the, of the site. And uh, again, sort of that same aesthetic that we saw in the front of the building. Um, on the, the upper floor, on the second floor, really kind of that alternating uh, void uh, and um, uh, or transparent uh, as, uh, as um, compared to like an opaque kind of alternating pattern on the outside. And then on the first floor, uh, punched openings within the masonry. Those are for the younger kids to be able to contain the views and provide a little bit of privacy, certainly on the ground or eye level over there. But uh, um, most significantly and importantly is uh, really the colors that you see, just a touch of color along the windows, um, those punched openings, as well as the, uh, the more expansive windows on the second floor. Um, it's, it's, it's a way for us, like I said before, to kind of relate to the uh, existing neighborhood in terms of the materials and even the colors, but also uh, the way we've implemented those colors just gives a hint that, uh, and a reminder to everybody that this still is a school, it is still for kids, uh, and uh, all the joy and optimism uh, of, of youth that is associated with it. So this next, this next slide, yep, this next slide is uh, really a uh, um, sets us up for a deeper conversation about the interiors and just a, a quick reminder of, of the organization of the school itself. So um, if you look at, uh, I don't even know if I could, I can't point over here, but uh, how do we get back? There we go. Um, on, the, on the left side is the first floor plan. The right side is the second floor plan. If we stick with the first floor, um, um, you, you see on the sort of the left side of that first floor plan, the main entrance in the bottom right-hand corner, bottom left-hand corner, 
flanked on either side by uh, the administration, uh, the main office, as well as some support spaces. And then to the north of that, that big green box, that's the tornado shelter um, slash gymnasium um, with the uh, dining commons just to the, to the right of it. Um, on the second floor, pretty much a, a similar pattern in terms of um, all those green spaces being the enrichment programs to the, uh, to the south of the gymnasium. And then instead of the dining commons, we have uh, the library on the lower half, um, right next to the enrichment spaces with direct access to, uh, to the first floor and the, uh, the dining and the caf cafeteria. And everything that happens then on the right side, both on the first and second floor that you see in orange, are the classroom neighborhoods. And at this point, what I'd like to do is uh, turn it over to Leanne so she could take you through some of the details that we have, certainly not only for the classrooms, but in the rest of the spaces around the building. Leanne? Yep. All right, thank you for having us. Um, been very excited. Um, myself and my team have been working a lot on the interiors. And as Craig mentioned, color is very exciting. And um, you'll see that we're using it um, very uh, courageously in the building. But the outside colors that you saw on the windows, we will be bringing them inside the building because we want to make sure that we tie the inside and the outside of the building together for a cohesive project. So the first idea that we had um, we, we're looking at organizing the building and naming the neighborhoods. Uh, it looks like the fonts are a little off, but um, we're looking at naming the neighborhoods and giving them some character to help the students know where they are in the building. So we came up with this idea of the landscapes of Elmhurst. So each of the neighborhoods will have a theme and it'll relate to landscapes that you might see around your Elmhurst area, such as a spring garden. Um, and so you'll see that on the left, the two gray colored carpets, those will be the field carpets that will be out throughout the school. And then in each of the neighborhoods, we'll mix in an accent color or two of the same carpet tile. Um, and so this is the character and the theme that would be in the kindergarten neighborhood. Some of the materials that we'll be using, some of the paints, some of the laminates. And then moving into first grade, River Grove, kind of a different cooler palette. So the students, when they go down the hallway, they'll know which neighborhood they're in. And there'll be some signage, which I'll show you in a minute on some of the renderings. Again, the same two gray field tiles will be used throughout the school to bring all the neighborhoods and everything together. And then you'll see a different color populate and then some different color paints will be used. Second grade, sunny meadows, meadows that are in the area some of the uh, colors that you see in the meadow, some of the textures. This is the feature color for that group. Third grade, as we move to the upstairs, um, the palettes start to get a little bit more sophisticated. This would be the prairie path and all of the features and colors that might be on the prairie path. Stone quarry, the fourth grade um, will get a palette that'll involve some quarry colors and some stones um, throughout. And then finally, fifth grade, Autumn Grove. So very distinct, but yet they will be pulled together by the use of this same carpet pattern and the two gray uh, materials, the two gray field colors that will be throughout the building. And then finally, bringing it all together, the dining space and the media center, the core, the center spine of the school will be called Uptown. And you'll see some of the colors coming together in that area. Um, and accenting the main circulation spine of the school. Okay. So this is what the palettes look like all together. So you can see that um, several of the paints are in different neighborhoods. So we do repeat some of them, but in different ways. But it comes together as a ver very cohesive piece, but yet each neighborhood will be unique and have its own character as you go throughout the school. So here's some views. First, we're gonna look at a typical neighborhood. So you can see, I put some blue arrows where we're gonna be in some of these views. Um, the first blue arrow to your left would be at the opening of the neighborhood. A neighborhood is four classrooms of the same grade level um, as we're proposing. When you look down in that neighborhood to your right, there's number one, that will be a signage piece. And I'll show you that in the rendering. So you know, again, 
if you're a first grader, a kindergartner, a fifth grader, this is my neighborhood. I'm in the right, right place. Then moving on to the left of that, there'll be a collaboration area, which on the first floor will be open kind of stadium seating. I'll show you that in a minute. And when you get up on the second floor, it'll be a little bit more mature as a glass um, group study room. Moving into the living room space, going towards the classrooms, there's a collaboration zone with um, um, number three is some three-dimensional storage. We can put some books in there. We can put some art projects on display for that neighborhood. We've talked to the media specialist and the art teacher, and they're very excited about expanding their programs out into the neighborhoods and the teachers as well. If they're doing a section on like Abe Lincoln or something, they can bring in books from the library for a couple weeks and have it in the neighborhood as part of their feature curriculum. Um, then number four um, on the other side, I'll show you in a minute, will be is a gallery wall. That is um, something from Lincoln School. They have a chalkboard wall currently, and this will be a plastic laminate material that you can write on with chalk, but also um, use magnets and pin things up. So a little bit of a modern take on the, the blackboard chalkboard wall that they have at Lincoln right now. And then number five, there'll be some some seating and a whiteboard wall and a flat panel monitor out in this living room. So very exciting space before you get to the classrooms. So this is the entry we uh, chose to look at Sunny Meadows. So this will be what the first floor um, entryways will look like. There'll be a colored paint portal going or framing the entry to the neighborhood and then that signage will be there. So you can see it coming from two different directions uh, it wraps around the corner and you'll know you're in the right neighborhood. And then you can see the collaboration space, which is the little seating area to the left, has some specialty light fixtures, making that space cozy, bringing the scale down a little bit. There's a quote. I put a Dr. Seuss quote there. And then you can see the bookshelf, which can have artwork, um, pieces, of projects, and books in it. Um, and you can see all the way down at the end is the classroom. So this is kind of the character, um, the carpet. There's some color accents going on. Um, and then this is what the upper level um, entrance to a neighborhood might look like. This is Autumn Grove, the fifth grade. And their collaborative space on the left um, takes on a little bit of a different character. It still has the light, light fixtures bringing the scale down, making it a special space. But it also has glass around it so that the older kids can start to work in groups um, or a, a teacher or someone, an aide, can come out and work with them and have a little bit more privacy around them as they get a little bit older. Straight ahead of you, you can see um, that black rectangle. That is the gallery wall that I was talking about that you can write on with chalk. It can be changed. Magnets go on it so you can put up artwork or, or if you're presenting, if, if students are going to come out and talk to their class and give a little presentation, they can pin their work up. And then you can see the Autumn Grove signage that wraps around the corner. So you can see it coming from two directions in the hallway um, to find your neighborhood. So this will be a view where I have the blue area, arrow. We're going to look at the classroom that would be on the right-hand side. So this is the view of like a first grade classroom, River Creek. And you can see the colors are used um, sparingly, but in very key places to draw your eye. You know, we have the soft color on the left around the teaching wall, and then we have a pop of color in the back around the window. And in each classroom, that window box will pop through. So that color is from the outside coming in, and you will actually be able to sit on that ledge and have a seat. Um, it's a little hard to see here, but the carpet, the grays kind of go over to those walls, and then the accent color kind of starts to spill in just around that color. So there's a little bit of yellow over in that area, kind of creating a, a reading nook or an area, and then there's a little bit of the blue teal carpet mixed in right in front of the learning center. The screen doesn't show it as well as our, as our paper. Um, and then now we'll look at the other classroom on the other side. And this is an older classroom upstairs. And the, the way you can tell that is we gave the older students on the upper floors, their windows in the back, you can see straight ahead, go all the way to the floor. A little bit more of a grown-up feel 
um, like being in a college or a university where the windows, you know, are a little bit more mature, floor to ceiling. But then again, on the side, this time we've chosen to put the window box coming through on the side of the room. So a little bit different dynamic for them, but again, they will be able to sit on this and the color comes from the window outside and a color also on the teaching wall. Then moving into um, the um, center uptown space, looking at what the dining and media center can look like. You'll see the blue arrow that I have is um, from, we're gonna be on the second floor and we're gonna look towards the north. So this is a view of what uptown will look like. Um, very sophisticated, um, bringing some of the colors together in certainly the, the lunchroom tables will have some colored laminates on them, um, bringing in all those colors from the neighborhood. You can see the, there's some light fixtures that are gonna dance up and down through the space and they will have the colors on them that are in the neighborhoods. Just to make this a really vibrant interactive space like you might see in an uptown. The stair on the end will have color on the inside but have wood, some nice wood to warm it up. As well as the railing around the second floor will have um, partial wood, partial metal, and um, a metal cap on the top. We, we did a lot of study in our office about what those railings should be. You know, if you went in a corporate office, they might be glass, probably not appropriate for students and cleaning and all that. Plus, these little ones might not want to see all that glass from up above. So we've uh, broken it up with some wood um, maple panels, like what we have wood in the rest of the building, and tying that together. The tall gym wall to the left um, is the, the storm shelter, so it's you know the precast concrete, but we will be treating that with some acoustic panels, some soft acoustic panels, but you can see the light fixtures up above wrap down, and they kind of make that exciting pattern, like if you were um, downtown or uptown and you see those lights coming down on some of the buildings, and then imagine the, uh, the fins, the colored fins that you see on there are acrylic and they have a coating on them that picks up the light and and just like when you're in downtown it'll look like those are like the windows or different lights of the city going along that tall two-story wall and adding some excitement to that um, there's some portals um, you can see kind of the orange one um, those are two wind there's two windows into the the gym space so that you can see the action and what's going on in there all the time and then between those there will be a flat panel monitor so we can have events and um, different projection outside in this space as well. Then the next view is going to look the other way so we're now going to be in uptown and look south and we're going to see a view of the learning stair going up to the media center. Okay, so this is the view the other way. Again, you can see that um, sophisticated palette, but yet playful, um, still com coming forward. Colors on the table, um, colors on the acrylic uh, fins on the tall gym wall, the dancing light fixtures. And then on the classroom side, the two corridors that stack uh, one above each other, there'll be some pops of tile. There'll be some tile around the drinking fountains, there'll be some tile, and certainly when you enter each neighborhood, there'll be a color. Um, we're still, this is still in progress. We're still debating if we need just a hint more color on the left side where the classrooms are, but um, looking down towards the south, you'll see the learning stair. That's taken on a, a lot of development with um, the different levels. About halfway up, there's a bigger level and a couple of bookshelves. So we're bringing the media centered halfway down to meet the dining halfway up. So there'll be some place for some like softer seating um, to gather and then uh, maybe some fiction books or you know things that can be ready to grab uh, for the students to encourage uh, reading and kind of their gateway to the media center. Okay. Then uh, speaking of the media center, now the blue arrow is showing you a view. We're going to look south across the, um, the help desk and through to, we'll be seeing the art room as well as the flex classroom um, at the south end. So this is a view looking back that way. Um, you can see um, 
way in the back, the window glass, that's the flex room with a folding glass door that is shut. And then immediately to the right of that is a display case that you actually see as glass through to the art room. But it, there's glass on the front and it's open from the art room. And we've talked to the teachers, you could put displays in there and everyone can see what's going on in art and celebrate. Um, a lot of transparency in learning and see, you know, getting excited for the art program. Right next to it um, is the maker space, and you can see in through that window at one of the some of the casework and the sinks that are in there. Um, again, very much on display, and if you go down one more further, we'll, we would see the music as well. Um, so this will all be everything in here. Um, you'll see the the bookshelves will be mobile, the, some of the chairs and tables in the back. But um, you know this side has a lot of the mobile pieces, and then on the side we're not seeing is a lot of the um, shelving in the stacks. But again, the library, the media center can always be rearranged. We've talked about in front of the help desk, we're, we're starting to hint at a circular accent carpet piece, which may have some of the dots or circles in it out of the colors of carpet. So we can have a group just gather and sit on the floor for reading or we can roll these stools on top of it. Very multi-use um, and uh, integrating a lot of different things that can go on in here. So this, I just wanna show you. So you can see we were just looking at half of the learning center to the south and up towards the north before you go down the learning stair is a lot of the stack areas. We've kind of talked to um, the media specialists and um, principal on you know some arrangements for some of this area. Again, all movable. So the next view in the middle there, right by the blue area, arrow, you can see there's a set of stairs. That stair goes right down to the main lobby to connect the first floor and the media center together directly too. So I'm gonna show you that view. So here's where the blue arrow is. This is where you come in and you'd be looking at that stair if you wanted to go right up to the media center, it's connected. Maybe you're gonna have a community meeting or an event up there, um, but also so the students can quickly um, go up and down at this end of the building as well, just like we had at the other end of the building. Um, a couple features here I'll show you in a minute. We're going to put some of the pieces from Lincoln School in this area, create like a heritage wall, and also, um, down just a little bit um, below the blue arrow, you'll see a sink out here in the lobby. We're going to have a hospitality area. So anytime parents come or you're having someone come in to see the, the student services work or an IEP or anything in this area, we're gonna be welcoming and have a hospitality area um, right here in this heritage lobby. And this is a view of what that, that's going to look like when you walk in. Um, to the left, you'll see we'd like to take some of the stone medallions off the building. I've already talked to um, ICI and Terry Fielding. We went out and walked the building with Jen, and we're going to take uh, many of those stones. We're not sure if we'll take more than four. We, this is kind of our artist rendering just to start this. And then we'd like to have some kind of graphics or a timeline, and you know we'll be working with, with you or a committee on um, what will that timeline be about? Will it be about the history of Lincoln? Will school itself, will it be about the history of Abe Lincoln? Will it be about the history of Elmhurst? You know, whatever we wanna do, we think we should integrate some of these pieces off the building here. And then I'm also thinking above the, um, the hospitality bar, taking the wood arched window from Lincoln's current um, media center and bringing the arch over and putting that above the hospitality bar. So. This will be the place where we'll celebrate um, the current Lincoln School and it will meet the new school in this area. And you can see the opening up to the media center. There's a skylight above, so this will be light filled. And it's another place where um, students and um, teachers can gather. It's outside the um, student services area. Maybe there's a time when they wanna bring a group out there. You know, they have some groups at lunch and just talk. I mean, they're. So it's gonna be a lot of um, places in this building that will offer um, collaborative support in many ways that you don't have right now in your building. So, so that's it. That's the uh, landscapes of Elmhurst and the new Lincoln interior theme.
So I can entertain any questions or I can go back to any views if you would like. I know I kind of went through that a little bit fast. And I hope you like it. Anybody have questions? Mine is just um, thinking about it from since COVID and um, people in, in the building um, and classrooms, they seem tight, maybe because of the angle of the view or the tables and chairs. Um, but, you know, that's a concern of mine is building new schools, but doing them in a traditional way where we still would have the same issues of more, more families and kids want to get back into the classroom more often than we can safely. I do think the view, the perspective does kind of maybe throw you off a little bit on the side of the, of the classrooms because they are larger than what you have now. Um, so that could be one thing. But also, this building's going to open, you know, a couple years from now. It's not, it's, it won't be the time of COVID. We're very hopeful for that. Um, so, you know, we've designed this really for the future of education. And on, on top of that, I, I might add, um, there's a, a, a number of things that are happening over here in, in terms of different kinds. The, the, the space itself or the school itself has really opened up compared to, you know, having, um, you know, the, the discrete, um, succinct spaces kind of contained and all that. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of different opportunities, as Leanne said, uh, for different things to happen. There are a lot of smaller spaces for kids to gather in groups. Uh, to have some privacy, um, to get that separation that you need. Um, there's also a little bit easier transition between uh, space to space. Um, you'll notice there's not a lot of hallways in this particular building. And um, that's the place where kids are bumping into each other, um, bumping off the of walls and so forth. There's none of that going to be happening over here. So there's a lot of different ways to move around the building, a lot more opened up. There's also a different size spaces and um, that you don't have in your school right now. And that... Uh, um, in conjunction with the size of the classrooms that Leanne, Leanne spoke about should really um, help the situation in terms of, uh, you know, keeping kids separated and, and, and respecting, you know, the guidelines and regulations that are set up for this unfortunate crisis. And another big feature that this building has as a new school, in addition to all these extra spaces that um, Craig was talking about, we do have two extra classrooms here, too, to help spread out. But the big difference is the new HVAC system will have bipolar ionization in it and double filtration. So there'll be two, si two types of filters in each of the units. The first filter will take all the large particulates, and then the second filter takes the fine particulates. And then the bi bipolar ionization then kind of cleans up the rest of the air as the particulates come out and they fall to the ground to be vacuumed and wiped off. So it's a huge advantage that this building will have these new HVAC systems because they're far superior, the air turnover far superior than what you have in, in your building now. It just seemed like it was a much more efficient building. It's all being done at one time versus, I can't remember, a half a dozen at least, you know, at least yeah. at Lincoln, you know, and so it was a lot of, you know, wasted space for, for yeah. you know, reasons the why. hallways, all the connections. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, but yeah, between the two of you, I think it makes sense. And understand, you know, yeah, we don't want this to happen, but we can't ignore the issues that we have oh, yeah. and therefore think about it moving forward just in case. So Absolutely. I thought the same things that you were saying, Craig. So thank you for addressing it. Yeah. Absolutely. Anyone else have questions? Chris, go ahead. No, I just want, I like it. I like it. For, for where we're at in the process, I think it looks good. And uh, my, my only question is, it's not, not a big site there, you know, physically, just the um, small site. And is this building going to consume the same percentage, roughly, of the site that the, the current building is, or is it going to expand? Oh, you know, footprint? sorry we don't have a site plan, but from the last presentation, I will tell you, it's, it's almost the same. I mean, because we're stacking two levels and two full levels. Okay. Whereas your current building is all over the place, if if you if the site plan were here, it's um, roughly in the middle, and we have all the play space to the north and parking to the lower south half, and we actually have more parking spaces. But when you look at it, um, it almost appears like you have more room because we've also grouped 
all the green space together where now if you go out to the site the green space kind of wraps around and the asphalt kind of wraps around your building and there's a lot of ins and outs and I think you don't get the benefit of pulling it together so it's 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 really an, a nice design and not taking up a lot more footprint because of the stacking of the two levels okay yeah. thank you yeah. and then just remind me process wise when do we start digging into how much this costs I like it so is uh, Terry, as as Terry Fielding <laughs> on the line? I could let Terry respond to uh, where they're at with the cost estimating. Okay, thank you. Terry? We're not hearing you, Terry. Unmute. Chris, really just, my question was just the timeline of when that happens. I don't need an update on um, He's estimating else. our drawings. Like, we gave him a 75% complete set, and they're estimating them right now. They're almost done with that check okay. estimate. Yep. And then we're completing the drawings on November 4th for them to get ready to bid, put them out to bid. Okay, thank you. That's sufficient for now. When I talked Chris, to Terry about it this morning, he said we we are on track yeah. with the budget. Budget, yep. Okay, we're tracking in the right direction. Right? Yeah, it's been tracking well all along, so we're we're pretty pleased. Mm -hmm. Good, it's good work. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you. It. It's our pleasure. We we really enjoy it. Yeah. Any anyone else? Because I I have a couple if no one else does. Um, Leanne, I think the heritage wall is is a fabulous idea. In fact, that whole heritage area, I can't encourage you. And I mean, Lincoln School has as a whole lot of very cool architectural detail inside and outside. Um, if you can get you know as many examples of that to fit into that heritage area, I, I think that would be terrific. I, I think we could tie together generations of people who have attended Lincoln School. Um, with a room like that. So I think that's a fantastic idea. Thank you. Um, and, and then the neighborhoods, I, th I think, are also a very cool idea. But uh, maybe things are incongruous. It, it just it bothers me, and maybe I'm the only person it bothers. But Elmhurst has a prairie path, with, so that's cool. We have a stone quarry. Um, we don't have a river creek, but we have a salt creek. Um, and I, well, and I don't know, and please anybody correct me if I'm wrong, I don't know if we have an area of town that we call uptown, but you had a picture of York Theater, and we, we I, at least as I grew up here, we called that area downtown. But Margaret's shaking her head that we have an uptown. I Margaret, where is that? Yeah. They call it uptown. uptown. Yeah. They do. I, we, <laughs> right. I checked with a uh, Elmhurst resident. <laughs> right. Yeah. All right. So, so there is an area of Elmhurst that calls what we've always called downtown uptown. It's still downtown to me, but <laughs> it's yeah. It's it's referred to as uptown. You know, believe that, it or not. That's fascinating. And, I, you know, I never knew that. But. Um, it, do we have a Sunny Meadows and an Autumn Grove somewhere? Well, the names aren't really li literal. Like, you oh. probably have a meadow and you have a grove of trees. It's not that you have a place called Autumn Grove or a place called Sunny Meadows. There just are meadow, a meadow somewhere that you probably jog or walk in, just like a pra pra prairie path. It wasn't meant to be that you have a place called Autumn Grove. And, you know, because we thought about, like, Wilder Park. We, we started looking at proper names, and then they were like, oh, we're not going to be able to fit them all in. We need to back off that. It needs to. So we're, now we're just calling it landscapes, you know, different. Or, or what if they change the name and then we're stuck? Yeah, right. So they're just three dimensional landscapes, you know, like a prairie, a path, a grove, a quarry, you know, so we didn't give them the proper names. So they're kind of you know, just kind of loosely fitting, you know, part of yeah. Elmhurst. Yeah, it's, it's just the incongruous, we're mixing real places in town with whimsical places. If they're all whimsical, let's make them all whimsical. If they're all real, let's make them all real. But, I mean, there are, I mean, there are a few uh, parks in the Lincoln neighborhood that have some interesting names, and I wish I could recall them, but that's not my... Yeah, I mean that's not my neighborhood, but uh, but 
I, you know, I don't know. I, I'm just saying, if yeah. we can make them all real places in the Lincoln area, that that's fantastic. Um, and then I do have another. Um, the the quotes is there going to be a quote on the wall in every single uh, area? We propose that. I'm working with. Um, I've talked to Jen a little bit, the principal. We're proposing that some kind of inspirational quote, especially you know for the little kids. Maybe the first one was about reading. You know, some some kind of inspirational quote. Okay, so you're you're working with with we Jen to, with to Jen, figure yeah. all that out. We'll review the quotes with you, of course. Got yeah, it. Got absolutely. it. Yeah, I, I agree. Inspirational quotes that. Yeah, uplifting. Yeah, right. or I mean, another thing is you could uh, have each grade level this year decide what quote they want to leave as their heritage for all future generations of that grade coming through. Yeah, I mean, it's something that, that I think the school yeah, could have a lot idea. of fun with. Yeah. You could so, survey and have a few. You know. Yeah, but bottom line, I, I think it look it looks great. Just I'm getting, just having a hard time with that picture of York Theater in the Uptown. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, thank you. Uh, anything else for Leanne? Thank you. All right, then we can uh, move on. Thank you so much. That was thank that was you. a great preview. Nice seeing you all again. And yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. It's your computer, so. <laughs> Todd, you can share your screen, please. I, I, I yeah, it's, it's. Todd it's Schmidt. Got to be congruous. Um, all right, so next on the agenda is the summer 2021 capital maintenance facility projects. Chris? Correct. We uh, we have Todd on the Zoom call. Todd, can you, can you say something? Um, when she closed this, it silenced everything. <laughs> Give me a second. Oh. Uh, sorry, let me figure out what's going on. All right, bear with us while we uh, pull the Zoom call back up. Okay. Um, is Todd sharing? Todd, you'll be sharing your screen. So he is sharing his screen, but I can't hear Todd. How about a little testing, 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 Todd? It's not going out. So, here we go. You think you, oh, we can hear you now, Todd. I apologize for that. You can hear me now? We can hear you now. Oh, yep. We've got you. We can hear you. So uh, we are ready for item B, the summer 2021 capital maintenance facility projects. Okay. As we sit there and look as uh, we normally do out of our Fund 65 is like summer capital work. Um, this is a list that we compiled for potential work coming up for um, this next summer in 2021. Uh, the first item on that list there is the uh, South Gym, uh, the area roof replacement. Basically, this is everything on the east side of the building um, except for the fuel house. Uh, we, uh, replaced a lot of the roofs out there over the last few years in 2016, uh, the academic building, the penthouse, and a few other spots. So this was the next area on the list that uh, based off our life cycle plan that we wanted to replace. Uh, the next two items, York Cooler Pool Boiler Replacement and the York Pool Locker Room. In the referendum uh, for next year, um, we have work in the pool area to replace the air handling units out there. This, these two items are part of our life cycle plan. Uh, we felt it was best to do this now since uh, we're gonna have uh, major mechanical contractors in there redoing the air handling units. So this is why we had these two scheduled up there. And then this will um, you know, take care of the whole area in the pool for the HVAC system. Uh, the field turf for the stormwater detention, um, I was notified by the city. Uh, they wanted to make sure that we had money budgeted this because they want to um, move forward with that stormwater detention in front of York. And with that is they would sit there and put the stormwater detention 
in there, put the stone on top, and then we would go in after the fact and then put the field turf on top of that. The gravel lot, we put that in there. It's a little bit less than what we had before. We've done some of the demolition work ourselves and a couple of other things out there. Simplified it a little bit. With this gravel lot, just to let you know, that's based on the current area that we have out there inside the fencing. This recommendation is basically 30% less space. So it's basically shrinking it up as compared to what we currently have out there right now. The next items, Sandberg, just the last piece that we have to do out there. We accomplished some of that paving replacement this year, this previous summer, as part of the referendum. This is just another little piece that we have left to do. Emerson intercom and clock upgrade. What this has is this summer we upgraded on all our security projects at Bryan and at Edison. We upgraded our intercom and clock system to a new IP-based system. The problem we were having here is the rest of the building, since we didn't touch it, has legacy devices. And we're having some problems talking to each other on those. So as we look going forward for next summer to do the next phase at Emerson with the interior remodelings, with the corridor, the learning center area, that's going to have a new IP system. So what this is is to expand that IP system for the intercoms and clocks and just do the whole building while we're at it. So that's something that's above and beyond what was in the scope of the referendum work. The district, the seal coating, the concrete, exterior doors, elevator upgrades, that's stuff that we've been doing every single year for our life cycle plan. Basically on those areas, we'll go out there in the spring, we'll evaluate our property, we'll do the security thing with the doors, make sure they're locked in properly, they're not rusted out, and if ones need to be replaced. Same thing with the seal coating and the concrete repairs. We'll evaluate everything. If we have an area that's going to be a slip, trip, or fall, or we have buckled concrete, we're going to sit there and replace all that. Same thing on the flooring replacement. A lot of the flooring replacement, this is going to be areas outside of the corridors and the libraries that we have in the referendum. These are going to hit the classrooms and a lot of corridors over at York. Same thing with painting. Painting is going to hit the areas that are outside of the referendum that we're going to sit there and make sure we get our gymnasiums, our multi-purpose rooms, York Fieldhouse, and things such as that. Lunch table replacement is we have in-wall lunch tables in our multi-purpose room. We're slowly going through that and putting money into the capital plan to replace all those over the next five, six years. Hawthorne gym floor replacement, it's time to replace that gym floor. We're looking at doing a wood gym floor in that one, just like we did in Churchville. It really works out well. And then part of that painting there, too, is we'll go in there and we'll have a contractor come and paint the whole gym before we put the new floor in, so it'll be a brand new gym. And then with our sanding and refinishing, our hardwood floors that we have out there, we did three of them this past summer, and two of them the previous summer were on that same rotation to sit there and do Jefferson and Bryan's gym. With the hardwood floor, they'll last 100 years if you maintain them. You go in there, sand them down, refinish them, reseal them, and they're great. This totals up to about almost $6 million. Some of the things that we added in there was the gravel lots and the stormwater retention area at about $2.4 million. So this is kind of where we're looking at what we're thinking. If we follow our life cycle plan and some other things that have popped up, this is kind of what we're looking at for next year. So the way we fund these summer capital projects is we make a transfer from the operating fund, from the Fund 20 Operations and Maintenance Fund. Currently what's in the budget is $4 million transfer from Fund 20 to Fund 60 to fund these summer projects. So this amount at almost $6 million is much higher than what we had put in the budget. So I guess we would need some feedback from the committee on what to do about the summer projects. Chris, can you just clarify 
fund 20 operating funds to fund 60? So the fund 20 is the operations and maintenance fund that's okay. part of the operating funds, part of the operating levy. Fund 60 is the capital maintenance fund. That is a non-operating fund. So currently what we do is we pay for the summer projects out of 60. With the bond issues, we're using 61, 62, 63. So they all do roll up into one, but we are separating, keeping track separately of the bond projects, bond funds separately from this summer capital projects. How much excess cash does our district currently have, Chris, in fund balance? So I believe on a cash basis, we ended the year at $63 million. Um, Not sure where the audit will come in because they are deferring the June taxes. And minimum cash requirement is 30? Uh, about 30% where we were at, like, I believe, 40 40 percent or more than 40 percent okay so if we're at 63 minimum cash is 30 excess cash low 30s ish is that the right way to think about it it sounds right okay and so the the driver of why this is higher than expected is because the stormwater detention project I presume was earlier than anticipated. That's gonna occur next summer now? Well, we, we've we kind of been a hold, on hold on this, Brian Ladd. I don't, I don't think we knew exactly where the board was on the Brian Gravel lot. And, and so I guess is we were, we were kind of not sure what, where we were, were with the Brian Gravel lot. Okay. Chris, can I interject? Yes, yes, sir. According to the intergovernmental agreement, uh, next summer when uh, we were supposed to do everything this summer, we passed a resolution to delay it a summer uh, for financial reasons for both parties. Yeah. So they are going to be um, uh, doing the stormwater project at York and the expectation is that we finish the Bryan project as part of our uh, agreement. Right. Understood. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't object to the um, to spending the capital. I mean, we're obligated to to complete those projects, so I I understand. I just wanted to get a sense for the drivers. And aside from what's here on this list, are there other projects that um, that you would like completed, but that you're deferring currently? Uh, yeah, there was one other thing that we were looking at. Um, initially, we were looking at doing the field house at the same time um, as the other areas of those roofs, uh, but we kind of uh, moved that up till next year uh, because we're doing all this big gym, or gym area, and we were having a little bit more leaks in the gym area, so I thought that was more precedence uh, that we get that done now, and then we'll do, look at doing the field house next year. Okay. So really just one meaningful project that we're deferring. Not a big backlog is my point. Okay, got it. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Margaret? A question about the field turf and actually the timing and um, wondering about the timing to complete that project and how, or if at all, it will impact uh, a school or classroom? Um, they're still in the design phase. Um, Kurt, um, the city engineer reached out to me about two weeks ago. Uh, we started discussing this. Um, it's a go on their end. Uh, we're gonna have to work with them. It's, I don't think it'll interrupt the start of the school year, uh, but it may interrupt anything we have out there during the summer because it's gonna be a big area it's going to probably take them four to six weeks, if not longer, with a lot of trucks coming in there to dig down in that center area, um, 10 to 12 foot. Um, once they're done with that, and then if we have to do the field turf replacement on, you know, like when school starts, everything will be contained within that area. Um, so we still could have the traffic flow and everything else. Um, I don't know the exact schedule yet um, until they get the final designs on that. 
I can't really give you a good answer on that. Todd, when you were talking to the city engineer, did you bring up the idea that we are socializing the idea of adding some parking spots at York? There is no reason that we should be paying for stormwater detention if we add parking spots when they can design it right now. Yes, I did reach out to them and we talked about that. They're going to look at that in that design. It's getting that detention across the road into that storm trap because they're going to be tying in more to the west and kind of where the bus lanes are there in front of York. So, but we did let them know that we potentially may be looking at relaying out the baseball fields and some more parking over there. So, they're going to design... Like I said, it's in design. So, they're going to design their water retention to be able to store water, have enough capacity to store the water from any additional parking spots that we build? Potentially. They have not committed to that yet. All right. Like I said, they just started this back up two weeks ago. So, I just reached out to Sean Benson, who is a civil architect or design engineer with White, and we're going to start these conversations with them because they, White did lay out kind of a rough layout of what we're looking at with that additional parking and moving the baseball field. So, we're still in the design phase of that. All right. Can you keep us updated as to the progress and what their plans are in terms of designing their capacity large enough to store water for any parking spots we may add? Yes. Okay. And then for the Bryan Gravel lot, can I ask our administration to contact the city, make it clear to them that once we invest $1.6 million in that Bryan Gravel lot, which I think is the biggest waste of money ever, that it would be highly unlikely after making that investment that we're buying any land from them or moving into their garage. That needs to be coordinated with the city before we waste a bunch of taxpayers' money. To spend $1.6 million on that Bryan Gravel lot and then abandon it a few years later would be an absolute pity. I saw an alderman this morning who was very enthusiastic about the idea of having the city coordinate with us to get us into their garage or next to their garage. And I explained that buying land next to their garage and improving it and then only to move into their garage needs to come up with a plan that would make sense to us. But I think we need to, you know, I think we need to be the squeaky wheel in this and just make sure that they're aware of the investment that we're thinking of making there and how unlikely it would be to coordinate our efforts moving down the line once we make that investment. And when are we locked in on that? Like, when do we need to make a final call on that $1.6 million? Well, I would probably leave it up to Terry, but we'll have to get that out to bid January, February at the latest because it's going to take some time for the shop drawings for the stormwater detention traps. And I believe in the IGA we have until September 1 to have it completed. January would be the latest time. I don't know if you can hear me. We can't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. Terry, we can't hear you now. We can't. Okay. And Todd and Terry, are there are there additional January. avenues that we could pursue to bring that cost down further? We could try to make it a little bit smaller, but there's a lot of, you know, the storm track itself um, based off the area that we have paid. Like I said earlier, it's already 30% smaller than um, the, the lot itself within the fence. Um, we took care of the demolition of a lot of things out there. We're, every week now we're getting rid of some of that um, 
recycled asphalt that the district has thrown out there. There's about two or three foot of that on top of it. We got rid of the trailer. We're doing some demo on electrical. So we're trying to do as much as we can in-house to lower that cost. We're looking at taking out some of the electrical unless we make it smaller, but then we have run the risk that if we make it too small, then it's not usable for us. Yeah. Well, I do think it's worth pursuing a dialogue and maybe thinking about how we could bring the cost down further or come up with a different solution. And if we can't, if we can't find that, then we, you know, we have to do what we're obligated to do. But I think it's worth spending a little bit of time between now and year end to try to try to bring that number down further. It is a large amount of money for, for what it is. So. Kara, can you. Yes, we'll, we'll look at that. Thank you. Kara, can you contact the politicians in the city and either talk about extending this deadline and try to assess their will for, you know, the idea of our moving our maintenance facility closer to their facility and just make them aware of what our plans are and that, you know, once we spend all this money, it makes very little sense to spend more to abandon this site to move to a site closer to them. Yes. Thank you. I have a question too, but. Please, go ahead. It's not on this topic. I mean, it's on maintenance, but not on this, Brian. Oh, well, I think, are we done with the gravel lot, Karen? You have something? Yeah, Todd, um, you had mentioned tonight, answering Chris's questions about the cost and um, it being 30% less space and um, you and your people doing a lot of the work. If I recall correctly, it was still the same dollar amount, though, that was budgeted last time we talked about it. Can you help me understand? Well, that's still a cost, you know, it, it was a little bit more than that. Initially we had it at 1.8 and then we went to 1.7 and then 1.6. And there, you know, there's still some work out there. I don't wanna, you know, say, okay, it's gonna be 1.3 million and then the bids come back, it's 1.4 or 5. We feel that this is pretty comfortable where we're at right now. We've removed uh, design contingencies. We've removed some of the uh, site work and some of the landscaping where we're gonna look at doing it ourselves. And we also removed some of the um, demo work. There have got to be less uh, obvious and less public spaces to put our maintenance facility on uh, you know other than Butterfield Road um, you know we are not enhancing the the look of the town by maintaining our vehicles right on Butterfield Road I mean it makes no sense to me it was we originally moved there as a temporary move and now it's becoming permanent and it, it just shouldn't be and that that's my opinion any anyone else on maintenance Todd I just wondered um, you mentioned the project that you were deferring when Chris asked do you have a general estimate of how much that costs uh, yeah that was about a little over um, 800,000 uh, if we're sitting there budgeting uh, $16 a square foot, uh, that roof on the field house is about 56,000 square foot. Okay, thank you. All right, anything else on maintenance or shall we move on? Move on? All right. Um, All right, next up we have Elizabeth Hennessy will be talking about the tax abatement. Elizabeth, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can, can you share your screen, please? Bad. Okay, 
Can everybody see the screen? We can. Great. Can you hear me? We can. Excellent. Okay. So tonight we're looking at options regarding um, abating debt service. And what that involves is using operating funds to pay debt service instead of the debt service tax levy. So this is accomplished through an abatement resolution um, approved by the Board of Education that involves both the transfer of the operating funds and the direction to the county clerk to abate the debt service tax levy all in one resolution. Um, and the board may authorize an abatement resolution on an annual basis. The reason that it's done on a year by year basis is that bond council fears that if we do multiple, if one board does multiple years in advance, additional, all the money for those abatements must be transferred all at once. And it, it appears to the IRS as an advanced refunding. And then we have rules and restrictions regarding that. Um, another practical matter is that uh, future boards may not want to make that same decision. It's on, you know, maybe they will, but you're kind of preempting that decision. So for that reason, those two reasons, typically abatement resolutions are done on an annual basis. So this impacts the debt service tax rate of the district's total tax rate, including the operating funds, which is the largest part of the tax rate. Um, so what we're showing for the following options is abating the tax levy for debt service um, by approximately five cents. And that was the first option to try to keep the increase that was uh, described to the taxpayers about the bonds to a minimal. So it pretty much keeps the current tax rate uh, very similar to what it has been for the, the full bond uh, issuance process, which is of course not complete yet. So um, one thing to keep in mind is that the tax rate for debt service um, may not increase or may go down if the equalized assessed value of the district goes up higher. And it's difficult to promise tax rate relief when taxing strategies of other taxing bodies are unknown. So, you know, we make our best estimate based on what we estimate the tax rate to be at the time and what the impact on the homeowner is. And, but just always remember that as an estimate. So we know the final EAV. Okay, so I apologize if the numbers are small for you to see on your screen, but just, whoops, sorry. Starting from the left side of the spreadsheet, we've got the equalized assessed value and in levy year 19 for taxes paid in 2020, we saw the EAV, equalized assessed value of the district go up 4.03%. In future years, consistent with our assumptions, uh, we are showing an increase of 1%. We've got the levy for debt from 19 that taxpayers have now paid here in 2020. Next year, um, the payment is going to go uh, likely to, or it will go to 14179000 So the next column shows the current tax rate and then the proposed debt service tax rate with the referendum bonds is next. So you can see in the 2020 levy year, we're supposed to go up by two cents from 48 cents to 50 cents. Um, then the next year it goes up to 56 cents, 57, 56, 56, 53, and then kind of stabilizes at 50 cents, 49 cents, and, and goes down over time as the debt payments are level, yet the tax base is projected to increase slightly. So this first option attempts to keep that tax rate very level at the 50 cent um, option. And so the dollars you see in the column labeled proposed annual abatements looks at the dollars that you would need to transfer into the debt service fund each year 
so that those funds would pay the debt service as opposed to the debt service tax rate. And in this particular option, A, they total up to $7.1 million. The tax rate reductions are shown two columns over, and the impact on a $500,000 home is shown in the next column. So it ranges around $95,000, $111,000, $99,000, $87,000, and then nothing as we kind of get down into the low 50-cent range and then stabilize with level debt service. So that was one option that we looked at with the Finance Committee. I think it was September 8th. Option B is an option the Finance Committee suggested where we freeze the tax levy for debt at the current rate or current dollar amount, which is $13,607,890. That's what taxpayers have paid this last year, 2020, from the 2019 levy. So then for 2020 levy, which is coming up, the district would abate $575,896 to keep that tax levy about the same. So in each year, we look at these various abatements starting this year in 2020, and over time those total up to $11,724,000. Again, it's a year-by-year decision, but the whole idea is that we're freezing the dollar amount that people pay on debt for the next five years. And you can see there's some relief here in 2020 by $33. Then it goes up to $133. This is all on that $500,000 market value home, $169,000, $152,000, $160,000, and then zero. But it's important to note in that last year, we go from $0.46, that last year being 2024 levy year paid in 2025, from $0.46 up to $0.53. So there's a little jump up there, and then it's pretty smooth around the $0.50 level from there on out. Option C is a variation of that same option where we're leveling out the payment here in levy year 2020 for taxes paid in 21, pretty much equal to the prior year. Then we're going up a little bit in the payment each year so that we're still getting tax relief, less than the prior option, but around $33 the first year, same as the last option, $126, $138, $96, $81, and then $0.13 in the last year. So it gradually increases the tax rate to the level debt service just to avoid any larger jumps. This option over these six levy years costs $8,825,000 based on this projection. And then the last option that we talked about was an option just for this year that is a large abatement of $3,175,859. So the idea here is twofold. We would abate the debt service down to the $13.6 million level, but then abate an additional $2.6 million, which represents the 2.3% CPI increase allowed under the tax limitation law that you are able to extend on your operating funds. So the idea would be that your total tax levy for both operations and debt would be the same as last year, with the exception of new property and expiring TIF districts, which is also treated as new property and doesn't affect the existing homeowners. So the decrease in this case would be on the debt service levy would be $179. It takes your debt rate down to $0.39, but again, taxpayers are seeing the total tax rate and that, you know, they can see these various pieces, but that's more what they're experiencing in a holistic manner. So the next year, of course, you know, would be 
the decision for next year's levy, but something might want to be done because you see that bumping up to 56 cents the next year. So if we just kind of line these options up side by side, we can see the abatement years, option A, B, C, D, and B, the dollar impact on that $500,000 market value home, the total savings over the six period, six levy years in each option, and then option B is just the 2020 levy year, 2021, where we're impacting the 2.3% CPI increase all in the 2020 year, and then total operating funds required for each of these abatement scenarios is shown on the lowest line. So you can see we can do lots of different things, but at this point, let me just pause for questions and discussion. Yeah, I mean, so I'm strongly in favor of abating an increase in taxes. I think it's, I won't support the levy without it because I just am against raising costs even further for families. So among these options, I prefer option D, which would be a full abatement of a growth in taxes this year. And then, you know, we can decide what we want to do to either smooth things out or not smooth things out based on the environment that exists at the time a year from now. So among these options, my preference would be option D. But I do think that some action on this is quite necessary, in my opinion, based on a few factors. So before the current crisis that we're all living through here, unemployment in our local community has risen significantly. It's doubled, between doubled and tripled. That alone is enough to justify not raising taxes, in my opinion. In addition, I think we're living through a period, unlike anything that I could recall in terms of cost of families who have their kids attending a public school, is rising faster than I can recall at any point in history. And that's because they're paying for tutors. They're pooling resources to hire people to watch their kids during remote learning. There's the opportunity costs of foregone wages because schools aren't fully open yet. And then obviously there's people who have decided to reallocate their kids out of our public school into private schools but are still paying taxes. So in my view, costs are already rising very significantly for our constituents at the same time that employment levels have declined. And typically during periods of economic hardship, you don't have the same cost increase for education that we're experiencing today because we have a unique factor now that we're all being forced into in terms of access to our facilities being restricted severely. So for those, that combination of factors, I just, I won't support any tax levy without a full abatement of tax increases. Karen? Yeah, I definitely support abating. My Elizabeth, if I look at it, I'm looking at, you know, A, B, and C, which to me are really favorable, but is it really the only option we have is D because it's a one year? Well, they're all, you know, the options A, B, and C this year, you would just be abating for the 2020 tax levy extended in 2021. You could kind of agree philosophically if you wanted to what direction you want to take for future years. And then next year, you would revisit the same item as necessary. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so fundamentally, I think that this is the right direction. We can show that we've been overtaxing our people. And so, especially this year, we really need to give them relief. We need to, you know, we need to do the right thing. But fundamentally, also, 
I think that this is just, this is more than a one year decision. This is an approach that we need to take. Um, and your numbers to me prove it out in A, B, and C. Yeah, I just had one more thing to add. So in in my opinion, in analyzing our, our balance sheet and the impact of abatement, I don't think that um, option D of full abatement of tax increases for this year would have any material adverse effect on either the short-term or long-term financial position of, of our school district. I think it's a strategy that avoids some of the uh, long-term compounding concerns that our administration uh, brought up during this process. And we have a balance sheet with more than sufficient cash to, re in my view, return capital to taxpayers. It's important to keep in mind that our, our fund balance is their money, not ours. And uh, we certainly have the flexibility to do that without impairing our, our future services to students or our financial flexibility um, in the face of, of challenges that we might face going forward, in my view. All right, uh, Chris, that's uh, an excellent point for all of us to remember that that fund balance is not our money. Uh, it's not the district's money, it's our property taxpayers' money. Um, and I would support the philosophical adoption of option B uh, because we can it has to be philosophically because it can only be done one year at a time but to make some kind of a public statement that that is the board's intent moving forward uh, and combine that for with for this year which is option D the full abatement of the 2.3 percent increase um, transferred from the op the excess funds and the operating fund to the debt service fund and also abating the increase in uh, taxes in the debt service fund, so a total of $3.175 million for this coming year. Um, we have plenty of we have plenty of excess operating uh, fund balance to easily absorb um, the 11 million over the next five years in option B, uh, along with the additional 2.6 million uh, that is encapsulated in option D, in option D. Um, and uh, Chris, I think you eloquently stated all of the reasons that this is the right thing to do, in my opinion. Um, there's a lot of hardship out there People are struggling to pay their bills, let alone their property taxes. And uh, I, I just have a very difficult time asking people to pay more this year um, for the services they're getting. I mean, everybody in the district is working as hard as they can. Um, you know, COVID is, is nobody in this country's fault. Everybody's hard, dealing with it to, to make it uh, the best situation that we possibly can, but the reality is um, it's causing hardship for, for a lot of the people that pay property taxes in, in our school district. Um, so like I said, I would uh, support the philosophical ad uh, adoption of option B, and for this year I would support the adop adoption of option D. So now, um, anybody else? Kara, Margaret, any comments or questions or? This is a, a question. I agree. I um, I don't believe this year is, uh, I don't believe next year we will return to what was once normal. Um, so uh, I think any strategy that we take needs to look at a more longer term process. Um, I am curious with the proposal that you mentioned, Jim, on um, uh, option B that that uh, puts the, the total abate or uh, a com abatement um, from option D into the first year, what that 
what that means to um, a referendum strategy. And I know that's something you probably don't have right now, but that would be a curious uh, decision, interesting decision to look at. Uh, Margaret, I'm not sure I understand your question. Can you? I guess I'm wondering if the proposal that you made, um, Bless you. the three using option D, but superseding that, no, I'm sorry, using option B, but taking that, that total amount of tax abatement that's listed in option D and putting it in to option B as in boy. What does that look like? That was my question. What would those, what would that look like insofar as numbers such as uh, the net debt service, the uh, tax rate, what would that look like um, over uh, time? That's my question. Yeah, uh, yeah Elizabeth, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, but um, if we abate this year the $575,000 in increase in um, debt service over last year, um, plus the $2.6 million that the operating fund is going to increase, and uh, instead of taking out of the, instead of abating the operating fund, we just abate the uh, bond and interest uh, levy by that 2.6 million. Um, right, so the 2.6 million plus that 575,000 combined, so we're keeping the debt levy flat and the CPI on the operating side flat, total this 3 million 175 you see in option B. Yes, um, and, and so, so I, I, I think to answer Margaret's question is that lowers the uh, the debt service um, levy to, uh, I mean, and to 39 cents rather than 50 cents. For 2021. For 2021, yes. And, and then if, sorry, so for 2021, I, I've got it, so I'm trying, you know, so then the debt service rate would be 39. Are we, would it still be, if we're looking out 21, 22, if we, or to continue that idea of option B. With uh, the jump, what would that what would that differential be? Is that still a forty seven? Is that something different? Unless you abated again uh, an amount from the operating fund, yes, then it goes to forty seven, forty seven, forty six, forty six. Right, but that's that's also you know that's an annual decision that we can revisit. Right. Right at the time. So I think that's an important part of the choice here is that, you know, we're, we're making a decision based on our balance sheet today. And if if there's unexpected developments over the next year, then we can adjust. Right. And in terms of how we choose to smooth out taxation in the future or not smooth it out. Right. Right. And, and in fact, if we abated um, option B for the next five years, um, in combination with option D for this year, uh, we'd be looking at a total abatement of around um, 14 million and change coming out of the uh, coming out of the operating, or I'm sorry, coming out of our excess fund balance, which would bring our if we if we didn't add anything to our fund balance over the next five years, but every year we do, um, if we added nothing to our fund balance, it would bring the fund balance down to $50 million, which is still way more than we need. But even that wouldn't occur because, because of new growth, because of TIFFs coming off, um, that fund balance grows every year. Uh I just, we budgeted a $5.5 million deficit this year. That's the biggest deficit we've budgeted in the past 10 years. And there is, I, I mean, it's hard to go out. We know that Moody's came out October 1st and said that the state is in the worst financial condition they've ever been in. And, and so that is a concern. That, I mean, there's no way to say that the state funding is going to continue at the same level it is today. 
Right, but the, it, well, of course, there's never a guarantee of that, but we have budgeted. To continue to say that we're going to have surpluses year after year after year moving forward, I, I, don't, know, I don't know if I would say that. All right, we've budgeted, uh, and uh, yes, the, the year that new growth goes away forever, um, then those surpluses likely go away. Uh, over the last 10 years, we have budgeted a deficit budget eight of the last 10 years. And we have had a de and we have added to fund balance. In other words, we did not have a deficit in 10 of those 10 years. And some years that addition to fund balance was close to $8 million. Two years, it was a little over $5 million. Several years, it's over $2 million. So abating $2.6 million plus $575,000 or $3.1 million for one year uh, isn't going to put the school district in jeopardy, uh, not even close. And I would also contend that the combination of option B and option D will still leave us with way more fund balance than we need. We are a pay-as-you-go operation, and over the last 12 years, we've accumulated $63 million. Yeah, and I think, I think to, just to level set, right, I mean, all we need to decide for now is what's the right decision for the following year, and if the state of Illinois uh, ends up causing pressure on our fiscal uh, situation for our district, then, you know, we always have the ability to kind of change the trajectory. So I agree with Jim philosophically on combining options B and, and D, but you know, for now we're just voting on option D eventually, I hope, um, if that's what the board decides to do. And we can, we can look at you know, whether the uh, additional years of option B makes sense at the time. Because I do, I do think it's important to bring up that you know, for all the reasons that it was accumulated over the years, having a fund balance is important. There are uncertainties with regards to taxes and pension issues and a variety of other things that we do need to protect ourselves from so we can maintain a continuity of services. Uh, adopting option D for this year, in my opinion, has absolutely no impact on any of that safety that we've accumulated over time. And we don't have to sacrifice that margin of safety in the future either, because we can make a new fresh choice each year. So, I have a question. Go ahead. So Jim, uh, this is a follow up to your comment about the last 10 years and the projection of deficit and the reality of not having it. What's the reason for that? It's very difficult to predict what new growth is every year. So new growth is primarily what's added um, to the fund balance every year. We, do, we don't budget for it moving forward because we don't know what it is every year. So at the end of the year, it shows up in fund balance because X amount of construction has been done in, the, in our district. Um, and also, you know, TIFs have rolled off, uh, and that resets. For instance, the TIF 1, the downtown Elmhurst TIF, uh, reset a couple of years ago. The city re-TIFed it, but when, it re when they ended the TIF a couple of years early and then re-TIFed it, the equalized assessed valuation reset from the level it was in 1986 to the level that the city ended the TIF. And that was quite a bit of money from, you know, it was, you know, 30, almost 40 years that that area had been TIFed. So that, that added quite a bit to the revenue stream, but it's it's hard to budget for it because you you don't know exactly what it'll be. So d does that answer your question? Yes. Thank you, Kara. 
Uh, thanks. So, um, Elizabeth, if there's a graph that you know we pull out a lot regarding the um, referendum and the promise, and I can't remember which years. You'll probably know um, where we go. You know the the tax, the you know it goes up and then comes back down. Do you have that? You know, I call it the hack. Okay. Yes, I can't really read the. Yeah, could you talk about that a little bit? You bet. The green line is the original uh, promise to the taxpayers where we gradually increase the rate for the bonds as the new bonds are folded in, and then it would come down. And the average of that was 55 cents, 56 cents. When we issued the 60 million in 2019, we decided to move that, that issue up. Our first issue was originally only going to be 25 million. And we did that because the market was great and we could move some of the project expenses up as well. So that brings us to this red line where we said, look, we will go ahead, and this is before obviously COVID and all this kind of thing happened. We will um, sacrifice a longer term, lower average tax rate saving millions of dollars over the life of the bonds for our taxpayers uh, at the 49 cent level and go up in tax rate in 22 through 26, as opposed to waiting for the rate increase to hit in 26, 27, 28, according to the green line. So that decision was in 2019. These abatements will basically cut off this increase in 22, 25, and 26, which is equal to about five cents. And so that would bring us more or less down to this blue line. Now, option D will make the rate go down in, for taxes paid in 21 a little more because we're going to reduce, if you follow option D, that's reducing the 2.6 million increase that otherwise would have been allowed the district or is allowed the district by CPI under the tax limitation law. So the line under option D would jump down a little bit before coming back up to this blue line. But more or less, all of these abatement options over the next five years kind of cut off this, this five cent increase that we were thinking it made a lot of sense to pay now at these low interest rates and then keep the longer term uh, payments overall much, much lower than the original promise. Okay. Yes, very and, much. And that, um, so essentially we're keeping it, I mean, relatively flat or, or, you know, over time. And that is option B, essentially. Yes. I mean, I, I realize D is an additional piece, but overall that option B would be that blue, create that blue line. Yes, and um, it would be a little bit lower. It would be more equal to exactly where we are here. See how it drifts up a wee bit? That would be pretty much flat under option B, and then it would jump up a little steeper. But again, you know, that's the idea of options A, B, and C, is to just cut off more or less that five cent um, increase. Okay. And then just to confirm, um, Chris or Jim, that brings us down to our fund balance sits around 50. Is that the end of that? Like if we did all that? If, our if new growth were to go away entirely over the next five years, and we did not add to fund balance at all. And if we say in the absolute worst case, the five and a half million deficit that we budgeted for this year is actually five and a half million, uh, then that would be a decrease of, here, let me, bear with me while I pull out my calculator so I can uh, give you an accurate number. There we are. So 11.724 plus the 5,500,000 this year 
uh, and the 2.6 that we're talking about. Uh, that would total 19824 Um Uh, that would bring our fund balance potentially uh, if, again, if there were no new construction for the next five years, uh, down to $43.6 million. Okay. And our, okay. So Which is, that's... I think that's a basically a downside case, right? And then you yeah. have. That the... is a worst case, yes. That's how I like to live those. What's yeah, yeah. the worst case scenario? Sure. Uh, but important when you think about the downside case, right, that we have the option to influence that each year. Right. So you so could decide can, not to decide, if you're in yeah. it. Because obviously right now, as we all know, you know, things we don't know, right? Right. Yeah. And and this, this gives you the ultimate optionality since you decide year by year. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and we, and we want, I mean, like part of the, I would say, you know, we've been able in this crisis to do for our students and support our staff in ways because we had resources, even though we are running a deficit budget, but we know we have the resources. And so we don't know what's ahead either. So those are the things that I'm, I think about, but I like hearing the worst case scenario. Yeah. <laughs> and a perspective is, I remember getting on the board and we had, we didn't have the fund balance and we did all these great things and grew the money. So, you know what I mean? It's, we need to do what's, what's right for everything and everyone. I do understand that um, the bond interest that we're still paying off from the last referendum was a reverse hockey stick. And, and that they, the thought was is that, and it wasn't just our district, everybody was doing it, that the economy would continue to go be good significantly. And it hasn't. And so I think that it's important for us to realize that that didn't happen. We built the fund balance from taxpayer money. We have it that we should now balance it to say we need to give you relief at this point and it takes away that reverse hockey stick. It's, it's looking at all of, our, um, all of our fiscal responsibility in all these areas that we've been doing. And I think that that's the what what that's one of the key responsibilities that we have I, I, yeah karen if if i can add to that that you know over the last 12 years the board the board of education has been very very fiscally responsible we have spent less than we've taken in every year uh and i think that this year is a very appropriate year uh to show our empathy for our taxpayers um, and acknowledge the difficulty everybody is having and uh, just by not increasing their bill. So, Margaret? Um, I, I, I think we, we talked about what we thought was worst case scenario, but I'm wondering if um, what haven't we thought of? So this might be directed to the administration. Um, what's at risk uh, if we do do this. I do think if, if we're only talking about the 2020 levy that our, our reserves do can cover that. Um, the future is really hard to predict. We a pension cost shift is definitely possible in the future with the state of Illinois being what it is. The other thing that has happened continuously is the increase in staffing for special ed and EL students. Um, staffing has, has continued to climb. So Salaries and benefits are our biggest driver in the operating funds on the expenditure side. So those are the big concerns. Staffing increases, premium increases on the health insurance. Of course, we are concerned about the revenue stream from the state of Illinois and the pension cost shift. 
those are, those are big variables and concerns moving forward when you but on a one year basis you know the reserves can definitely cover option d the um because it's a tax uh, tax cap situation i think jim made some good points about the fact that new growth has helped us and and we don't know for sure uh you know how to predict that on a given year and we also you know don't expect to get any any relief with some of the big um influx of cash that resulted from the tip releases uh which which uh, Jim also alluded to earlier, uh, the um, the increase that we get in EAB typically covers the increase in our operational and labor costs based on um, uh, you know the the inflation rates of what we have to pay people who um, we have contracts with and what we pay our employees. So. You know that that's probably um, something that we'll need to take into account in our planning process because that's what we typically would use to absorb those types of costs. But I, I and to to Chris's point as well. I mean, over the last ten years, the district has increased uh, the number of our students by two hundred and sixteen students. And we've hired 98 new staff members, so one certified staff member for every 2.2 students that's come into the district. And as Chris pointed out, um, that is the primary driver of our increased costs. So you're, you're correct that that is the primary driver, and I will um, uh, explain you to the best of my ability the, the reason for that. Number one, Chris alluded to special education and EL. Number two, our middle school model is expensive. Number three, when you get enrollment growth, it's easier to take a look at the one-to-one -one impact of additional students at the elementary level when you predict staffing. But you don't get a one-to-one -one increase with staff at the high school because of the way the schedule's built and the number of classes that they take and all those kinds of things. So that's not a one-to-one, -one and and that um, uh, I don't know if I need to explain that, but conceptually, um, uh, there there is there's a factor there, and the, the other than um, other than the special ed, we actually did reduce some some middle school uh, staff due to the reorganization, but other than the special ed and EL services. Um, the biggest increase was that we uh, chose to add instructional coaches. And that is about, of the 90, however many FTE you mentioned, I think that's about 20 of, of that is, is attributable to instructional coaches. Yeah, and yeah, no, I, you don't need to explain it to me. I fully understand it. Um, but my point is that we've added all those staff and we've added to fund balance every year along the way. So we've been able to afford it. Um, you know, and, and the town, uh, I believe our school district just expects uh, excellence in education and uh, is gracious in the way that they provide us the resources to do so. And you know, in return, we owe them that excellence in education. And, you know, we've been able to afford it. Um, and I don't believe that, that this puts us in jeopardy of affording it in the future. So, yeah, so uh, Finance Committee, you know, we... Uh, we're, uh, are, well, how do we feel about recommending uh, option D for this year to the board uh, with a philosophical recommendation in future years of option B as well? Yes. Chris, you're a yes. Karen? Yes. 
Okay. So we have a unanimous recommendation of option D for this year and a philosophical uh, adoption of option B, uh, recognizing that option B has to be taken on a year-to-year -year basis. Otherwise, we run into a bunch of uh, pre-funding rules with uh, the municipal bond regulations. Okay. All right. And, and, and Jim, I would just, you know, present it just like we have for the um, refinancing. It, it's that same concept. Yes. Yeah, I agree. And, and it's proven very successful for both our district and for our taxpayer. Yeah. And that's what our responsibility is, is both. Yeah. Um, should we move on to item D? I had yeah. one question for Elizabeth on a different topic. Okay. May I ask quick? I just wanted to, or Chris, just a quick update on, you know, we've been, we passed a resolution for bond issuance. I know yeah. we're, yeah, oh, I'll, that? uh, that's updates. Okay. I'm sorry. Well, actually, do you, I, I was going to address that under updates. Do, do, Committee want to address it now? Sure, why not? Yeah, sure. Maybe we could cut Elizabeth's night short. <laughs> yeah, give her, give her yeah, some that'd time be great. Back. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, Elizabeth, feel free to add to this. But uh, we came to market uh, on Wednesday morning, and uh, the market just wasn't there on Wednesday. So we did not price the deal. Uh, the, we had demand for part of the deal, but uh, it was not all sold. Uh, Raymond James, I think, did a great job of putting together what they could, but the market just didn't support it. Um, and it was purely a timing issue. Had it been two weeks ago, had S&P given us a rating, you know, two weeks ago, had renewed our rating two weeks ago and we were able to immediately come to market, uh, we would have gotten the, we would have had an all sold deal. But uh, this Wednesday, it just wasn't there. So Elizabeth, uh, who has served us extremely well uh, for my entire time on the board, uh, is going to monitor the market, and uh, we're going to keep that rating current so that we can act quickly. Um, and Elizabeth is going to recommend the next good entry point for us to come back with the with the deal. Elizabeth, anything to add? Thanks, Jim. Thanks for that summary, and thanks for your kind words. It was, uh, you know, we've had. An incredible stable market. We've had demand from buyers of bonds all summer. Very stable, very strong. And uh, unfortunately, this week, um, even Monday, it was a little better, but Tuesday and Wednesday, the supply is so large that um, we have what's now called more outflows, more investors are selling bonds and buying bonds. And they're very picky, so they were very happy about the district's credit. There's just too many bonds in the market. And we don't have to compromise on rates. We don't have to get this deal done now. So our recommendation is to wait, wait for a better day. Uh, we know the Fed is committed to zero interest rates. We have an extremely volatile time here as we get into pre-election and uh, that volatility did not serve us well this week. So that's the beauty of the parameters resolution. We, uh, nothing lost except time for uh, Chris, Jim, and Kara. Um, and we will watch the market for the next opportunity to, to uh, get the deal locked down. Elizabeth, that's a great point that, that first of all, there's, you know, given everything that is going on, um, you know, there's quite a bit of volatility, and and that we have the since, you know, we don't have to borrow this money, you know, until well into next spring. We have the luxury that we're trying to take advantage of a market that uh, allows us to borrow money at uh, very low rates, and so we have the luxury of waiting for the market to come to us rather than having to accept whatever the market has to offer on the day we come. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thank you. Thanks Thank you. Everyone. All right, next is item D, the tax levy. 
And uh, Chris is talking to our technical people right now to get uh, an illustration up on the screen for everybody that, to see here. So the estimated tax levy, we will be uh, bringing this to the October 27th board meeting. So I, I'm not going to go through it in detail. I'm going to kind of just get uh, go quickly through it here. Okay. Um, you guys, the board has seen this a number of times, the timeline. The, the CPI is 2.3 for this levy. Uh, this just kind of shows the, the when the EAV is going up, the rates go down, and when the EAV is going down, the rates go up. Um, in this levy, I have estimated an increase, so um, the, the rate would be going down. This is just shows the inverse relationship between EAV and tax rate. And here, you know, determining the levy, um, we, we know that uh, 2.3 is the CPI, but we have some unknown factors, which is the EAV and the new construction. And the new construction is the most important piece of the, the levy and the tax extension. And this shows past new construction. And the residential is uh, our consistent new construction, where you can see it's in 2015, it was 29 million, 16, 34 million, 17, 33, 18, 32, 19, 26. So what I'm estimating, and it's just just looking at the trend, there's no, I, I haven't done any real research into what the residential new construction will be. We don't find out until um, late March or April, is that I estimated 25 million for the residential EAV and 8 million for TIF 3. So my rough estimate at new construction is 33 million. Um, we levy for an additional 20 um, because that that is to allow for any underestimating. Uh, maybe it comes in more than what the what we're estimating, so that's why we levy a little more. But no matter what we levy, the county only extends the increase allowable under the tax cap. And so this kind of chart kind of shows the the past since 2012 to 2019. The lowest line, the purple line, that is the, the CPI. The yellow line or the orange line right in the middle, that's what we actually got um, in tax extension. So between the purple and the orange, um, that's the new construction piece that's above the CPI. Um, so between the purple and orange, that's the actual. But the blue line on top, that's what we levy. And so we always levy a little higher because we don't know what new construction is at the time of the levy. So the, the, the between the orange and the purple, that's the new construction. And then above, that's just, you know, because we don't know what new construction is, we have to levy a little more. On a, on a $500,000 house, um, the, the, if new construction came in at $33 million, um, it would be a 2.5 increase to the district or an increase on a $500,000 house or $180.52. That's if we didn't abate. Obviously, if we do the abatement in D, that would be zero. I think Elizabeth said 179. We were just a dollar off, but it's it's basically that would be a zero um, if we did option D of the abatement. But so that's what that is, and this shows the numbers of uh, a 3.47 is what we would 
estimate getting the increase on operating um, if there was 33 million in new construction. So this, so the left, the left column show where we were in the 19 extension. The middle column, that's the levy. That's the high, the blue line that I was talking about in the chart here is the levy at 4.19 operating, 4.08 overall increase. And then in the right, that's what is estimated based on 33 million new construction. So estimating an increase of 3.55 in property tax extension. So that's, that's just kind of a preview of what would be going to the board in um, October. October, we do the estimate. December, the board approves the final levy. And I think at that time, we would approve the resolution related to the abatement in December. Um, and I would think that we would recommend a transfer from the working cash fund to the debt service fund in order to cover the abatement in December at a December board meeting. But so this would come as an estimated levy in act, uh, at the October 27th, the hearing, so then we put it in the newspaper, the required amount in order to have the actual levy hearing in December. And that's when we would do a resolution related to an abatement and a resolution to transfer from the working cash fund to the debt service fund in order to cover that abatement. So that's really all I had for item D on tonight's agenda. Okay, thank you. So the next item, I think Dr. Moyer would like to talk about the fact that we did have that $5.5 million deficit this year in the budget. And he wanted to talk about some uh, like what the board would like to do for next year's budget. Yeah, so I, I don't um, I, I don't expect any decisions tonight. I think that when it comes up at the uh, finance committee report um, on Tuesday, I would like to ask and get clarification on where the board is at because the, the planning for next year's budget and, and our programming, our sports selection, um, it, uh, everything that's involved uh, in planning for next year really has already started. And um, I don't feel comfortable that, we, that we're um, projecting this much of a deficit this year. Um, and, I, and I don't think obviously that's sustainable. And so, uh, I want to get some direction. If the board is looking uh, to make sure that we that we have a balanced budget next year, which we typically have done uh, every year, uh, and um, this is an anomaly, but I want to make sure you know we had a lot of one-time expenses due to COVID. We put some more money into maintenance uh, than we had in previous budgets. There are there are things like that that Chris and I have explained at times uh, to various people. But we're gonna need to get clarification for planning purposes if we wanna make sure that we return to a balanced budget for next year. Uh, the administration needs to know that and we need to uh, plan for that in our decision making, which is starting um, or already has started. So I just wanted to make that clear that I, that I wanted to approach the board to make sure I knew what its expectations are uh, as we go into the planning for next year. Hey, Dave, I think what would be very helpful in that discussion is if you uh, came on Tuesday also with a, a sheet that showed uh, the attribution of that $5.5 million deficit, how much of it is related to one-time COVID expenses how much of it is related to increased maintenance expenditures, and just you know, it would help refresh the board's memory and exactly how much of it is recurring versus how much of it is one time, 
how much of it is structural versus how much of it is discretionary? Well, I think that, you know, we're not completely sure how to attribute everything that's related to staffing because of our, our sub costs and all the needs and everything. So Chris, um, I'm sure can come up with something uh, and we'll try to make it as precise as possible. And so Dave, sorry, you're, you're saying that <clears throat> you would like us to comment on this issue now, or you're giving us a heads up that you want us to comment on it. Well, on I, just, I mean, you can, I'm, I'm not, I'm not trying to prevent anybody from commenting, but I don't know that, um, you know, I don't know how the board feels about uh, having that conversation at a finance committee meeting as opposed to a full board meeting. Um, you know, I, I'm not afraid to, I, I certainly have no problem if people want to um, offer opinions or suggestions or comments. Yeah, I think, I think it's probably best to hold off for the full, you know, let everybody opine. Um, so I'll, I'll hold off on my comments until, until Tuesday, but thanks for the heads up. Okay. Yeah, Dave, it's Karen. I think that it, it would be important for you to present what you're thinking about and what you need for us to discuss. I think that that's what you're saying, but I want to get clarification. Well, what I'm saying is, is if, if, if we go back to a balanced budget scenario, and I sit down with Chris, and we take a look at um, our budget projections and what that means, and we have to sit down and do our planning, if we have to make any um, structural adjustments or if we need to um, uh, reduce our expenditures in any different areas, um, I, I would uh, bring things forward to the board so the board could have some options uh, to look at to see what we're thinking about um, I think it's a little premature for me to say that um, these are the different types of decisions we may have to make if I don't know what the parameters of the board expectations are. Sure, but I guess I'm coming at it from just the opposite end and trying to look at uh, yeah, who knows. So, so here's a thought that I have is some people say that we're going to be in this for next year. If we're in this for next year, what are we really gonna do? I mean, more and more families want their kids in school. And so it's a, it's a totally different conversation than I think that I would have, which just, I'm gonna call it nickel and diming, <laughs> you know, just to put it into perspective. You know, I, I might have the discussion a lot bigger than the small tweaking that we might need, which I know that this year, it doesn't seem like small tweaking, but, you know, I guess the thing is, is that how big or how small are we going to talk about it? Like, are we going to plan for a normal year? Are we going to plan for a COVID year? Are we going to plan for something that's better than the COVID year? And then I would have different I, I responses. Need know, I need to know if assuming that there are not a lot of additional COVID-related expenses. Is the board's expectation that we return uh, and ensure that, that we go back to um, uh, a balanced budget scenario? Got it. Okay. Yeah, if you can, you know, bring the information of uh, what's one time and what's structural, uh, I think we can have that discussion Absolutely. on Tuesday. All right, Dave, did you want to take the next item, which is all day kindergarten tuition? Well, I know that some board members uh, have suggested that, um, that we look at our all day kindergarten fees. And obviously we've had parents that have uh, emailed us and uh, questioned the fee structure for all day kindergarten. And so, you know, the board passed the uh, current um, fees, which were a cost-neutral scenario. I think we, we determined the program cost to be about a million dollars and hired teachers accordingly uh, and whatever other, you know, that was the major expense, but there could have been some other minor resource expenses and other things like that that went along with that. And so, um, 
We've given parents the option to return to the half-day model if they want to do that, and some have taken that option. For the ones that remain, there are still people that, because we're not in a normal situation, are questioning the fees. I can't adjust the fees without board action, and I need to know if the board would like for me to come forward with a proposal with some adjusted fees that they could then vote on to consider some adjustments for this school year. And I think the finance committee could give me some direction on that that I could then bring forward to the board. I think Karen's got a quick question. Yeah, Dave, can you outline just briefly, what is a half a day, what's a full day, kindergarten? Currently? Yes. Currently, our half-day kindergarten students go for half of the five hours, and the full-day kindergarten students go for all of the five hours on the days that they're in school. And then on the days when they are remote, the programming is adjusted so that there's the equivalent prorated amount of time on the remote days as well, only it's just remote instead of in person. So we are offering a different program for the full-day kindergartners. It's just not what it would be if we didn't have COVID. Correct. If I came, if I came, if you wanted me to come forward with a proposal, it would not be to, I would feel very uncomfortable with a proposal to eliminate fees altogether because they have the option to go back to half-day as it is. I would come with a proposal that includes a proration. We would lose money, you know, which, you know, we're losing some now for the people that go back to half-day. So obviously we would make our cost projections if we did that, which is, you know, something that, you know, arguably we should, we should consider under the circumstances, but I just wanted to see if you would like me to bring a proposal forward. Yes. Yeah, I think that'd be worthwhile. Yeah, I think it's worthwhile to bring it forward. And I personally would like to see the fees adjusted to align with service levels. So I'm going to plan on doing that at the October 27th board meeting then. Okay, that sounds good. All right, so that's really all I have. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. All right, thank you. And then we move on to September monthly financial report, which now has two dots so we can make a line. Like you said, Jim, it's still very early. So, uh, but I, I guess I'll just point out a few things um, that um, that I've noticed um, in the, so we're in the three months of the fiscal year and we don't pay teachers in, in August. We start paying them in September. So it, it's really very early in the year. Um, the property taxes at this point in the year are 0.92% higher than last year. So um, that's, you know, not too bad considering, um, so it's about a 1%, 0.92% increase in the property tax line in the operating funds this year compared to last year. The replacement taxes um, I pointed out that 
you know, the state of Illinois is budgeting, uh, is, is estimating a 17.4% decrease in this line. And based on that, I had budgeted a 20% decrease, but so far we've gotten that 542,254 compared to last year's 362,406. For some reason, at this point, we've had an increase there, but it's not aligned with what they estimated or we, what we budgeted. Just pointing it out, uh, you know, it's too early to really tell anything from that, though. Uh, investment income um, rates are way down on, on investment income. So, um, so far, we, we've collected uh, 33757 compared with last year's 197000 so that that's a huge decrease in interest income. We had budgeted a 26% decrease in interest income. Um, as far as you know, the evidence-based model funding that always it's a zero percent increase that will be consistent and flat. It's it's what we budgeted it, and they pay it every time every month uh twice a month and it's going to be exactly the same as last year that's the one million one eighty two seven thirty six compared to one million one eighty two seven thirty four last year uh the state categoricals were at two thirty six compared to two twenty five so the state categoricals it's it's right in line with with last year um but i guess what's what i've noticed um on the positive side here on the on the uh salaries um we are at a zero percent increase at this point in uh in the year you know some of that has to do with the covid and we we've got less food service uh employees less lunchroom supervision um and, and so at this point salaries we had budgeted a 6.3 increase and we are at a zero percent increase so on a budget you know monitoring the budget standpoint the salaries is a positive thing right now uh, that we are are trending less than what we had budgeted because we know we added more than eight new uh, staff members this year a lot of the increase was all day kindergarten and um, so so that is going well only again very early but I, I just thought I would point some things out just since we were going through the monthly budget report things that I've I've noticed uh, so far this this is the highest cash flow month of the year because you get your June tax collections, you get your September tax collections, and then from, from September through May, it, it goes down. So that's why you see this amount at 69.72%, the 96,367 there in the operating fund balance September 30th. This is the high point every year. You see 93 million last year, 96 million this year. We're at 69.72% of uh, expenditures at September 30th. Last year, we were at 70.75. Um, this is the high point. We, every month, because the expenditures will be consistent, but we get revenues twice a year on property taxes. Um, so that's, that's where we're at there. And this chart I know uh, kind of illustrates the cash flow situation september's the high point and it goes all the way down each month from here through may uh, but when you look at the little solid black line is this year the little black dot is is just higher than last year and the red dot is just higher than last year almost i mean uh, very very close to on the revenue side and the expenditure side exactly where we were same point last year and uh, that's really all I I wanted to talk about on the monthly financial report so with that um, 
I don't have any other updates at this point. <laughs> We've come to the end of the agenda. Uh, are there any updates? No updates. We covered the bond issue update, so we're at the end of the we were at the end of our agenda, so our meeting is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>